Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. My name is Darian Degampache. Uh, I am the Senior Vice President of Digital Strategy uh, for the Howard Hughes Corporation. And today uh, with me is Mick Bass, uh, who is the CEO of 47 Lining and will actually be giving the majority of the talk, which is why I'm assuming most of you are here, to understand kind of the architecture and some of the operating and technical nuances of uh, modern data lake. Um, I want to start by basically saying that there, uh, for this session, what you should expect is really understanding how a data lake is constructed, how it's being applied, et cetera, et cetera. All the technical stuff Mick is going to cover, and you're going to get a lot out of that. But I thought it'd be useful for me to set the stage as to why a data lake is useful from a business context. And I feel like data lake uh, in 2017 is going to be the term cloud or utility computing or something that was uh, the nom de jour previously in the last few years. And I remember when Amazon Web Services first started coming up, I would sit in boardrooms and they would look at the head of IT and they'd say, how much does a cycle cost? How much does a CPU cost? What's our cost of storage? Blah, 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 blah. Because it was that fine grain, uh, that level of granularity around the cost structure of the value of technology. And so I think data lake is going to be the next term that happens. And I think it's going to be very mainstream in corporate boardrooms, offices, CEOs who may not understand the technical nuances that we all do from a data lake. And I think it's going to be because of this guy. Um, if your board or CEO is not aware of what a data lake is, they're going to know about it very soon and be expecting questions around Project Alamo. This is going to hit the mainstream media very quickly. Uh, it's interesting to think about what this was. In a span of only a few months, they assembled a data lake of 220 million plus voter profiles. They did over 100,000 hyper-targeted ad segments and microsites and collected over $200 million in donations in most corporate parlances, that's revenue, in under 120 days, right? And when you think about that, that has a seismic shift in terms of understanding for a corporate board member or CEO or a non-technical audience, why do I want a data lake and why should I invest in the technology, the talent, the people, and the operations to get it done? Uh, for us, that started a while back, and so I want to just talk a little bit about the business challenge that we were facing and why we thought of a data lake as a technical construct to achieve some of our business goals. First, let's start with our company, Howard Hughes. The way that we say it is that we play SimCity for real. We take vacant land, we build it up, we do things with it, we develop it, we take that money so that we can get the cash and then do it again. And we do that from coast to coast and across the ocean, or as we like to say, from Wall Street to Waikiki, including Summerlin, uh, for those who may be familiar with the Nevada area. We own that master plan community and that vacant land, as well as some of the mall assets and other things that are there. And that was uh, the foundation for how we resurrected the Howard Hughes real estate empire. When we bought that asset, we acquired the naming rights to it. So that's Howard Hughes in general. But let's talk about the real estate industry a little bit to set the business challenge behind why we would want a technical tool like a data lake. Real estate is actually not that complicated. Uh, it really requires a ton of money. Uh, it's very capital intensive. Uh, but the problem with real estate is not just capital. If you compare it to any other asset class, if you think of real estate as an asset class, it's a $40 trillion asset market. Uh, compared to, say, 30 trillion in public securities, stocks, bonds, those types of things. And it's the last one to be digitized. Because anybody with a pulse can become a real estate broker, right? Um, and there's lots of human interactions and lots of people in the middle trying to say what that asset is worth or isn't worth. It's also very connected to a ton of microeconomic events and macroeconomic events. And that's what leads to things like the 2008 crisis. Uh, what's interesting is that there's no real estate broker that hasn't declared bankruptcy in the public markets. They're worse than airlines or maybe as bad as airlines in a lot of cases. So we wanted to use data as a way to be a smarter real estate company because we're only five years old. And if we are in the business of building generational wealth, we need to have generational class of data. Long product cycles. Some of our product cycles are two years, but most of our product cycles are actually 30 years. It takes about 30 years to build that out. And it's a commodity offering, 
right? People in real estate don't like to think that, but it is. Steve Wynn probably thinks his hotels are the best, and Shettle Adelson probably thinks his are the best. But the reality is that they're all the same. Hotel rooms, restaurants, casinos, et cetera. It's a commodity, right? Uh, and it's a hyper-fragmented market, meaning no one player is dominating any position. So when you think about that, and it's like, hmm, how can we use information and data to make a smarter real estate company? We decided to look at a big data problem. Again, data lake, new parlance, big data is something that was the buzzword when we started this uh, journey. And really what we wanted to use is data and information, which we see as two different things, uh, to really predict the trends, forecast demand, and speed our time to money. In real estate, the faster you can get your capital back, the faster you can put that capital to work and do it again. Uh, and could we do that with lower risk? Meaning, could we understand and create new value models, new pricing structures by using non-traditional data that maybe we had or non-traditional data to find correlations and causalities in terms of a lot of the pricing mixes. To do that, I was tasked with building a team that had a pretty simple mandate, uh, but some very technically tough challenges. We had to combine very large public and private data sets Sometimes they uh, were easy to understand, sometimes they're not, which means that the ability to do those joins and do those types of analyses uh, can be quite difficult. And one of the first things that we had to do was we had to be good practitioners of good data hygiene. And people who sold us their data were like, yes, yes, the data is super clean and super easy. Wrong. We had to clean it up a lot. Uh, so don't let any data provider fool you and think that what they're giving you is super easy to ingest. It's not. This is very tough stuff. Uh, and we have had to have our uh, executives understand that what we are building is very akin to building a 30-story building. Once you top it out, the architecture, you can start to do stuff in, the, in between. But you wouldn't expect a 30-story building to be built overnight. You shouldn't expect a data lake to be built overnight. It's very difficult. But if we could do those things, we were pretty confident that we could use then machine learning, which is separate from the data lake, to build new pricing and valuation models. And we could build proprietary models to keep us the smartest real estate company around. But real estate is a nickel and dime business. So we had to do that without adding substantial labor costs or exploding our infrastructure and licensing costs. Uh, in technology, those two things seem to go hand in hand. You build a platform, why, to do something, and next thing you know, you've built three platforms or four platforms. Uh, we could not afford that because that's not, our, that's not how our business works. As I said, nickel and dime business. To do that meant that we had to have some big mental shifts in the company, from the C-level board suite all the way down. And we are thankful and we are fortunate in that our executive leadership has really grabbed this mantle and helped us along the way. The first thing is that they had to understand that the people that were involved with building the data lake needed to be responsible for delivering profitability. We had to deliver a top line. That means we are looking at talent as a profit center and not as a cost center. And keep this in mind because it makes the investment discussions and how you acquire talent and what you're thinking about doing very, very different from the current context. The second is that we needed to understand that data is an asset. Real estate is notorious for having run on two things, secrets and spreadsheets. That's basically people. What we're saying is, hey, real estate should be just the same as stocks or bonds or anything else and surface that information to the people who are buying or selling it. Right? Not that uncommon. I still don't understand why Zillow has all the brokers in the middle, but that's for another topic. Uh, but that data is worth a true dollar figure. And we had to think through what does that mean, which meant that the traditional way we think about technology overall, the function of our digital team is not the same thing as the IT organization. They're both necessary, but they perform very different functions. A case study on how we thought about this, we said, hey, before we go off and you know, just spend too much money on doing this, let's think through, could we actually perform this? And we said, okay, what would a case study look like? So we wanted to build a data lake to take in all that data and then use machine learning to see if we could accurately predict indicators of people that would be likely to purchase very expensive high-end real estate in a market that had not been tested. 
And we thought that we could find pieces of data information. Remember, go back to Project Alamo and Trump. Could we use other types of information to try to figure out what people would do from a behavioral standpoint? We had a new luxury product in an untested market. We needed way more leads. We thought about this in an e-commerce space. Most real estate, you put up cranes, you put up signs, you wait for people to walk in, and you try to lease them the space, or you try to sell them the property. Instead, we wanted to figure out who would likely be most interested, could we contact them, and could we reach out and try to convert them. And that meant we had to drive down the cost per lead. And we had to build a machine to provide that continuous insight. So we said, hey, let's go out and figure out in our target market versus the whole US market, control and experiment group, take all the information you can, a ton of stuff, create a bunch of union views, structure that out, and then feed it into the system, feed it into the bots and see if the bots could kick back uh, some machine learning signals and some machine learning features so that we could come up with lookalike models and apply that to the entire US residential property market. And what we did was we said, okay, if we're gonna do this, we need a technology, but we need a talent group as well to go do this. And so we reached out to 47 Lining and Amazon to try to structure those two things. Amazon from the technology and 47 Lining from the partnership perspective. And upstage now is gonna be Mick Bass, the CEO of 47 Lining. And I think what's useful is in understanding how we have worked together to create what he's about to kind of go over with you. We have a model where we are applying web agile technologies to data analytics. And I think that's the key differentiator for 47 Lining and what we have done is we've taken the kind of web construct of UI, UX experience and applied those agile frameworks into web analytics, machine learning, and even the data sources that we're looking at. So with that, I wanna welcome up Mick to the stage and he'll go over the stuff that you guys actually came to hear. Thanks, Darian, and thanks everyone for joining the session to learn about how we can use enterprise data lakes to power machine learning to drive business value. A data lake, lots of people kind of understand the, the technical description of it, but to join the setup and the framing that Darian uh, placed on the, on the table with the technology, uh, I'd like to describe how we think of a data lake. A data lake's really an economic concept and a set of processes that are powered by technology and talent. And the kind of technology that you use is important, but equally important is the way that you can use the technology to unleash the talent to build a portfolio that creates value. It results in an actively managed portfolio of data providers, managed data sets, and agile analytics processes that the business increasingly relies on. Now it turns out that building an enterprise data lake on AWS is a really good fit. And the reason that that's the case is that there's a really strong individual capabilities match between the underlying AWS services and the requirements to build out an agile analytics platform. These characteristics essentially involve parallelism, scalability, durability, and elastic on-demand characteristics. You want to be able to really drive the marginal cost of onboarding an incremental data provider to near zero, and you want to free up the business owners to make decisions about when and whether to commission an incremental agile analytic process to feed a particular desired business outcome. But you need processes uh, and some technology to assist in these economic uh, uh, processes uh, to create the portfolio so that you avoid the alligators. Um, you need a set of stakeholders that are constantly tending and, and uh, concerned with the question, do the created value outputs from the data lake, uh, does, the, does the value of the uh, created output exceed the cost of the inputs? And so in our early dialogue with Howard Hughes, we really started with the framework for the foundations of the data lake and how we would plug in incremental uh, analyses, including uh, the machine learning use case that we'll walk you through uh, later in the presentation, so that they could be empowered to actively manage uh, the commercial deals that they did uh, about onboarding data. Uh, and we could also manage the agile analytic uh, capabilities that we developed during uh, the sprint process that Darian described. 
Uh, so to do this, uh, we use the data lake reference architecture. Uh, and I'd like to just walk you through uh, a couple of simple but really important points in you know, what's kind of a complicated looking slide. So first, ignore everything in the middle and just focus on the outside. Here we're really talking about the types of actors and how they interact with the lake. The second key concept that I'll walk you through is the notion of a data life cycle and the value progression of data through the lake, starting from raw submissions, uh, resulting in published data and realized business value. And then finally, we'll talk about the portfolio of agile lakeshore analytics that draw data from the data lake and they enable us to create and maintain managed data sets uh, within which there's option value to the business team. Those data sets rationalize and define uh, the way that value can be surfaced and created, and they reduce the cost of commissioning incremental uh, lakeshore analytics because there's less rework that's required. So first, let's look at those actors on the outside. Four main types of actors. They're data contributors. In many cases, these are not humans. Uh, they're ongoing business processes. They're automated uh, ingest of uh, OLTP transactional databases. They're feeds from SaaS providers, or they're uh, uh, drops from uh, commercially licensed data providers. On the right, we have the data consumers. These are the folks that are concerned about what data sets are available. Uh, how are they using the published outputs that have been generated within the data lake to guide their decision process so that they can uh, realize the value that you're you know, trying to drive towards. Uh, and in many cases, uh, the data consumers may not even be in your own company. Uh, you create the value uh, data. You want to share that throughout a B2B ecosystem. And they're, you know, you're commissioning work through the data lake that enable the business team to get the right deals in place so that the right offers to consumers can be made. And then finally, there's a set of stakeholders that are actually creating this stack of agile lakeshore analytics. Um, and those people need to know kind of what the design rules are for how to access the data within the lake, uh, how to tap into the broad suite of underlying uh, AWS services that are possible to tap into to create the agile analytic. And then once they have uh, you know, distilled the information down uh, to some published uh, result that can drive business value, where do they put it so that the consumers can easily intersect with it and find it? So against that reference architecture, what we can do is we can play out the data flow for the high-level use case that Darian teed up. The objectives here were pretty simple. We wanted to identify leads with a high propensity to purchase luxury real estate right now. And right now is important because there's some you know, descriptive kinds of uh, uh, analyses that you could undertake that say, well, in general, I think Darian might be interested in buying a condo. Uh, but we're really interested in identifying those behavioral attributes that give us a strong signal that not only is Darian capable and perhaps interested in buying a condo, that he might be in the market and able to transact, say, within the next six months. This is important because uh, the, the true underlying driver for this business use case was to reduce time to sell out. The capital is already committed. If we can bring in uh, the time to sell all of those properties, uh, that turns into uh, an incredible uh, ROI uh, that enables that capital to be reinvested for a different purpose. Further, to achieve this objective, we not only wanted to understand which individual consumers might have a high propensity to buy, but what can we understand about them in terms of what might be an appropriate way to engage, uh, depending on how they're segmented within the market. What is their persona? Is this someone that I need to like put a person on an airplane to go and you know, meet him? Uh, is this someone that you know, maybe I should uh, have a very high-end salesperson place a call to? What, what's, the, what's the appropriate way to engage? And so the key data flow here uh, to enable those uh, is to start with submissions from data providers on the left, uh, including the dialogue about 
which data providers are going to be the most valuable to feed this uh, machine learning use case. Uh, once I have uh, understood who those data providers are, uh, get their uh, drops and feeds in place through a variety of mechanisms. And which mechanism do you choose? You choose the cheapest and simplest possible uh, thing that you can use to get started. In many cases, that's uh, harvesters that you know, pull feeds from FTP sites and drop them in S3. In many cases, uh, the data providers are themselves already consuming AWS, and so they're very simple policy-based mechanisms that we can use to uh, entitle us to simply go grab and harvest their data. You'll see then that there's a progression of uh, manufacturing that begins with the raw submissions that are very data provider centric into a series of managed data sets that we saw against the reference architecture. And the purpose of this is really to uh, reduce the cost of downstream analysts. Uh, Darian talked about the complexity of the joins that are required in some of the data sets uh, that, that we're describing. So if you can imagine, uh, say, uh, a feed of every real estate transaction in the history of the US uh, against all tiers of the market, uh, you can start with like, you know, kind of raw events that describe those transactions, uh, but that's probably not the most optimal uh, way to express that information so that you can perform feature extraction for machine learning, for example. Um, and so there's a set of processes that progressively uh, add value to the information based on the understanding of how analysts are likely going to need to be able to use it to drive value in the future. In the use case that we describe, there are several Lakeshore analytics that end up being the core of the implementation for the use case. Those things are orchestrated. In many cases, they create a whole bunch of temporary information. It might explode up and then kind of shrink down. Um, and you can use the on-demand and elastic uh, characteristics of AWS to have a lot of flexibility in the resources that need to be available to those Lakeshore analytics as they're running. This produces what we call a union view, which is a managed data set that's like really cheap and inexpensive to join on. Uh, and this is the basis that we'll use for two key downstream processes, uh, cluster and persona generation and uh, machine learning, feature extraction. So the union view provides this stable foundation for downstream analysts, and based on a really tight feedback loop with business stakeholders, what we'll do is we'll uh, have a conversation about the kinds of features that might be extracted from that data uh, that will increase the performance of segmentation to uh, generate personas that can be used for the sales team, uh, as well as features that can be used uh, to feed machine learning training so that you can get increased performance of the resulting machine learning models that predict propensity to buy. Now, those underlying processes themselves, the clustering process, feature extraction to support machine learning training, training of the model, and then ultimately batch predictions based on the, the generated model, those are all examples of agile analytics in that stack in the portfolio of managed agile an analytics. This is an example of some of the outcomes that come from the clustering process. Uh, we did clustering based on subset samples of the entire population. Uh, we used R uh, to conduct this work. Uh, it's repeatable and uh, can be orchestrated based on uh, the managed data sets that are created from the uh, incoming submissions. These personas really drive how to engage um, and the appropriate engagement mechanisms that can be used by the sales teams. But in addition to how to engage, we really wanted to focus on whether to engage. Uh, one of the I think historic issues with uh, particularly the high end of the real estate market is it's very difficult to understand whether to engage and whether like uh, uh, spending sales energy is gonna be productive at all. And so for this we use machine learning. We defined a ranking function 
for propensity to purchase in the immediate future. And to do this, we developed an ability to replay history in the real estate market. What you want to do is you want to rewind time and uh, play out how people actually behave uh, against this union data set in the um, uh, data that you see that's being fed to the uh, machine learning training process. Uh, there are a series of extractive features that come from the union of all of the data sets that Howard Hughes has procured. And through replaying history, we can pause history at a particular period, maybe a year ago, maybe six months ago, and uh, then we can have a look ahead period where we ask the question, how did this person actually behave? Uh, did they end up buying a property that is sort of like kind to the property that we're trying to move and, and sell through? And if the answer is yes, then the machine learning uh, model can attempt to learn to predict that based on the descriptive consumer characteristics, behavioral characteristics, and their aggregate historic real estate uh, uh, behavior. To do this, we created training tables in Amazon Redshift that were fed to the uh, Amazon machine learning service. And the uh, creation of the training tables is one example of an agile analytic uh, within the reference architecture. Once the model is created, this can be used uh, to uh, identify every day uh, potential leads and re-rank the existing population of targets that have been identified. So train the model infrequently, uh, uh, once a month, once a quarter, every night, uh, gather incremental aggregate real estate behavioral data, uh, run an automated process that orchestrates uh, the series of agile analytics that are required to uh, create a new list of target candidates and ask the, uh, the machine learning model in a batch fashion uh, to predict each of these uh, candidates' propensity to buy. This can occur at very large scale. You can basically do it for every single person in the country. And you can create a stack-ordered list of uh, uh, potential candidates with some indication of who's likely to buy the most, not just of real estate in general, but of the kind of property that uh, the business is uh, uh, trying, to, trying to move. And once you have that list, you can have some heuristics that you can use to focus the sales team uh, on those candidates that you think are gonna be the most productive and most fruitful. Here's an example of the kinds of tools uh, that result from this process that the sales team uh, can use to drive their engagement activities. Now what's nice about using Amazon machine learning in this process is that uh, by combining the Amazon machine learning service with this agile analytics approach and an orchestration paradigm that is harvesting submissions of data providers through to cleansing and creation of uh, the managed data set in the union tables, uh, combined with extracting the machine learning features uh, that can uh, enhance the predictability of the model, uh, you can really tighten the loop time. You can have a dialogue with the business owners to say, we have a premise that if we describe the characteristics of the property type or the property category that you're trying to move in the following way, we could probably get some better predictive capability. And you reduce the cost of experimentation so that you can you know, run that multiple times a day, multiple times a week, you can fan out to a lot of models and see which ones work the best. So it turns out that the part of that flow that I described as feature extraction is pretty important in uh, driving uh, acceptable predictive capabilities from the machine learning service. And we have found that Redshift is a really powerful tool that makes this pretty easy. And I thought that uh, we would share in uh, a specific example, uh, but first I'll share some sort of categories of uh, feature extraction capabilities that play out against this kind of data set. And in many cases, 
uh, an extracted feature is just an aggregate uh, computation uh, that reflects a, a summary kind of behavior, maybe on a quarter by quarter basis uh, about uh, historic behavior over time. Uh, average co uh, consumption per month or year is a good example of this. Um, many, many uh, extracted features have to do with essentially time domain to frequency domain conversions uh, in the data. If you think about how uh, the machine learning service works, uh, it's, it's basically looking at samples and you know, trying to create best linear fit. It doesn't really work very well if the signal that you're trying to detect is encoded kind of periodically over a long period of time. Uh, but transforming into uh, a different domain can make that signal really vi uh, visible and easy for the machine learning service to detect and can drastically improve the performance that you, uh, that you end up with. Um, volatility analysis is uh, another feature that's often extracted. It's not just uh, whether something is happening, it's is it happening consistently? And then finally, time series difference analysis comes up a lot. Um, you know, between time A and time B, how much did something happen? And then I roll the window forward and I want to look at that again and I want to look at that again. Here's a specific example, kind of a complicated picture that sort of illustrates the point on the left. Uh, if we walk through this, under behaviors one, I have, call it purchase behavior of a particular uh, customer. And arrows that are pointing to the right call those purchases, and arrows that are pointing to the left call those sales. And so you can see that by looking at the, in, you know, the, the, the native representation of the data as it's provided by the data provider, it, it looks something like that. It's expressed in rows and columns, et cetera. But um, it's pretty straightforward to come up with a picture like behaviors one and behaviors two that you could choose to present to the Amazon Machine Learning Service uh, and ask it to try to you know, make some predictions based upon that. But it turns out that it's really hard to get to the signal that you care about from that presentation of the information. Uh, so on the right, um, you know, the approach that we take is we establish an agile analytic that is responsible for feature extraction. And uh, every night, it's grabbing the incremental real estate transaction data and it is transforming it into a different representation that's really talking about frequency of purchase and net value of purchase. Net value is an interesting concept. It's basically you know, trying to determine, is this individual a net purchaser or a net seller or kind of in the middle? Because some people buy, sell, buy, sell because they're capital constrained. Uh, other people buy and collect. And it's hard to know which they are just by looking at like narrow windows of individual transactions. So through these uh, feature extraction processes, you can create a really simple way of expressing uh, the behavioral characteristics that really end up mattering in predictive capability. Now, once you can do that, you can also extract features over different time horizons. You can ask the question, is this person a net buyer and a net seller? like for all of their purchase history over the past 10 years, over the past one year. And if you tile that out with respect to uh, a, a series of features and present those in the training tables to the Amazon Machine Learning Service, it has a lot easier time consuming a representation of the information that you see on the right than what you see on the left. So the technical benefits of this approach are really leverage in a couple of different dimensions. First is leverage in terms of the services dimension. You've got managed services that are provided by AWS that essentially just work. Um, one of the reasons that we like to use the Amazon Machine Learning Service is because we don't have to spend any of the energy from uh, the, the, the value added time in terms of the the business dialogue that we're having about which features are likely going to drive value. Uh, we don't have to spend any time in terms of thinking about how do I scale up the capacity uh, to run batch predictions. We don't have to think about hosting. 
Amazon provides all of that. But you also get value in terms of uh, increased throughput from your analysts. Because by thinking about a portfolio of agile analytics and a portfolio of managed data sets, uh, you can create value that's represented in the data. There's real option value in there because when we create and express the data in that way, cleanse it, maintain it, uh, it reduces the costs to folks like Darian when he comes to us and says, we're considering a commercial relationship with an incremental data provider. How might we join that in to the existing portfolio of data? Because all of that work doesn't have to be redone. It also doesn't lock you into a particular structure. So if there's like some like crazy complicated data set that you know, fundamentally doesn't like uh, uh, correlate or join well with anything that you've done, the answer doesn't have to be, well, that doesn't fit in our model, so we can't do it. The answer can be, we can do that, and here's the incremental work that's going to be required uh, to ease the joins or cleanse that new data set. And so with that, um, we'll hand the discussion back to Darian to talk about the payoff and some of the benefits to Howard Hughes. Thanks, Mick. So as I said earlier, uh, the team was tasked with doing a couple things, right? And I said that it had to do it in a cost structure that made sense because real estate is a nickel and dime business until the exit. And the exit is really kind of the payoff. And so what Mick did with this first experiment that we talked about, which was actually, we thought it would take quite a long time to get this up, and it took us less than a quarter, I believe, to get it done. Uh, we met all the goals. It's extensible, it's adaptive, it works with open standards uh, and lots of different partners, and we've been able to bring on new partners and really explore and explode the kind of innovations that we can do from a business perspective as well as a technical perspective. Keeps our, our board happy, it keeps our technicians happy. Um, and it's on demand and we have an ever growing talent pool. Uh, so I just wanted to thank 47 Lining and crew and thank you all for coming. Uh, robots rock, we think. And with that, we are open for any questions that you guys may have. So Mick, why don't you come up? Because uh, I think most of the questions are probably gonna be directed to you.